Okay, uh, welcome to the 21st Century China Center public lecture. Um, and of course, uh, the School of Global Policy and Strategy is where we are. Uh, we're home of um, a master's program in Chinese economic and political affairs. Uh, many of you are in that program. Uh, on top of that, of course, uh, the School of Global Policy and Strategy also is home for us, which is the 21st Century China Center. Uh, we are a research center and a think tank based in UCSD. The center's primary focus is on conducting cutting edge empirical research, engaging with businesses and policymakers, and fostering educational exchanges with our counterparts in China, of course. Um, our discussion uh, goes beyond academia and includes policy discussions uh, the center also plays a critical role in promoting informed dialogue and shaping the relationship between the U.S. and China. Uh, for most of you know, I am Victor Xi. I'm the director of the 21st Century China Center and Ho Miu-Lam uh, Chair in China and Pacific Relations, uh, as well as an associate professor at UC San Diego. Uh, today, we're very happy to welcome Jessica Tietz uh, to our miss. Um, to discuss her new book, which is, I have it here, Lobbying Autocrat, The Dynamics of Policy Advocacy in Non-Democracy. Uh, professor Tietz is a professor at Middlebury College, of course, uh, home to the highest level language training still mm -hmm. uh, in the United States, uh, a Templeton Fellow for the Asia Program at the Foreign Policy Research Institute, and uh, maybe associate editor-in-chief of Journal of Chinese Political Science, but maybe not, I, I don't know. Uh, anyway, until recently, yeah. her research focuses on governance in authoritarian regimes, especially a lot of pioneering work on the role of civil society and civic participation in authoritarian regimes. If you haven't read her work, I strongly, strongly urge you to do so. Uh, she's author of Civil Society Under Authoritarianism, The China Model, uh, uh, published in 2014, as well as Local Governance Innovation in China, Experimentation, Diffusion, and Defiance uh, with Bill Hurst. <laughs> yes, we won't get into that part. Mm -hmm. uh, and then of course, the new book uh, co-edited with Max Rumping, uh, Lobbying the Autocrat, the Dynamics of Policy Advocacy in Non-Democracies. I think the title is kind of gives us a strong hint of what's <laughs> in store. And I can't wait to hear more about it. Thank you. Great. Thank you. <laughs> Hello, everybody. Thank you all for coming out. Um, and just a quick technical question. Is it OK if I um, get rid of the yes. Zoom screen box? I think that hides it, right? Yeah, it'll hide it. OK. Perfect. That way you all will be able to see the screen without a box in the middle of it reflecting you. Um, so uh, I, what I wanted to do today, because we have such a short period of time, so, so it's a big book project, but I only have 30 minutes. And so rather than try to cram in a whole description of the book in 30 minutes, which would be miserable for you, miserable for me, instead what I wanted to do was really talk about the motivation of why we did the project, like what we were trying to accomplish, and then focus in on the key lessons. And then I'll try to punctuate these with some examples of my research from civil society in China, but then I want wanted to save all the rest of the time for discussion and Q&A. So um, hopefully we'll have a really good discussion. It won't just be me talking. Um, so first of all, for political scientists, when we study regimes, we try to divide them out into you know, democracies and non-democracies. And increasingly, the literature has sort of taken what Tom Popinski calls an institutional turn, meaning that really when we study non-democracies, we look at the governing institutions. So this is a very elite-driven description of how authoritarian regimes work. It's really focused on things like parliaments, um, single parties, uh, you know, elections, these sorts of institutions. But what we all know is that 
there are people also involved in this, right? So these theories don't have any room for people. The only time they ever talk about people is when there are protests, right? So when we talk about Egypt, we only talk about the single party and we talk about elections until there's an Arab <laughs> Spring. And then we talk about people. But people are involved in daily efforts to change government policy or advocate to make their communities better and safer places to live. They're doing all of this work all the time. And so the first goal that we had was to try to bring this back in, right? So what we want to do are take all of these great case studies, including Victor's work on fiscal policy in China, to take all these great case studies that we have about where everyday people involved in advocacy have changed government policy in non-democracies. We want to pull that back in and say, how do we understand governance in authoritarian regimes when we're looking at people? and not just elites, right? So that's what we wanted to do. And then my own sort of pet peeve is that in studying China, which is you know a big dynamic country, I'm usually pushed off into this, this area studies group, but I'm also a political scientist. And I find all the time that when I'm studying China that I have a lot to say about general political science theories based on what I know in China. And as do all of these other people who study Russia, Tanzania, right? All of these other countries. And so how can we bring these really detailed, rich, wonderful case studies into the general literature, right? And how can we use them? So that was sort of the, the goal that we had with this project was to bring the people back into our theories about non-democracies, but also use the rich detail and case studies to build theory. So that's what we wanted to do with this project. Um, so again, I'm not going to talk about all of the case studies because we have eight different country case studies, as well as three chapters where the authors do large N analysis using the varieties of democracy data set. If for those of you who are working on um, graduate work or, or undergraduate research, it is a fantastic resource. So, so check out the website. There's just so much more data that we have about authoritarian regimes than, than we're used to having, right? They really used to be black black boxes and there was no information. And now there's a lot of information. So, um, you know, this is looking at entry regulations on civil society and access to policymakers. And the reason that I wanted to show you these cases is that we're looking at a wide variety of cases here. So we're looking at authoritarian regimes like China, which is, is fairly authoritarian, um, all the way up to like Montenegro, right, which is more of a competitive authoritarian regime. Um, so some of these countries have elections, some don't, um, and then some have also moved back and forth or flirted with authoritarianism, right? So like if you look at Turkey, you can see a lot of movement over time. Um, and so we try to look at all of these really diverse cases because we're trying to identify these patterns in non-democracies for advocacy. So what we do is we use a framework. Those of you who study American politics will probably recognize this framework immediately. This is a life cycle approach to interest groups, and it's used to research democracies, right? So the United States, Western Europe, all of these countries. And basically what it does is look at each stage of the life cycle for advocacy groups. And it looks at how the, in democracies mostly, how groups form themselves, how they compete with other groups in the marketplace of ideas, what sort of advocacy strategies they use, and then what sort of outcomes do they get? So this is a really typical framework used in a democracy. And you might say, why would you use that framework then to look at China? China's not a democracy. But the reason that we wanted to do this is we wanted to try to understand the ways in which non-democracies were unique and the ways in which they were similar to democracies. And the reason that we wanted to do this is that we thought that it would shine a spotlight on what was truly unique, right? And then what was just something that we see with lobbyists. So I'll show you the findings and, and see what you think of to our efforts. So in this first stage, remember, this is the stage where groups haven't existed and they're just forming. So they're trying to register themselves and get some sort of legal status. They're trying to attract volunteers. They're trying to get funding, right? So this is just that first stage when they start to form. <clears throat> and what we see in our case studies, again, those eight countries, is we see that in autocracies, as you might expect, we see fewer numbers of groups and that the groups are smaller. So we don't see necessarily like an Oxfam forming in an authoritarian country. 
So we, we see fewer groups and the groups are smaller. We also see that there are these no-go issues. So there are certain issue areas where groups just can't form. They won't be allowed to form, right? And so the registration process or the funding process will hold them out of certain areas and not allow them to form. But it really interestingly, we see that in this stage, groups that are providing technical information, especially in a developed economy, that sort of information is valued across the board. Groups like that thrive, whether they're in democracies or whether they're in authoritarian regimes. We also see um, that this is also driven a little bit by issue area, right? So there are certain issue areas that whether you're in a democracy or an authoritarian regime, we just don't see groups forming, right? So that people are being motivated by policy. So we see some differences, but some similarities in this first stage. In the second stage, I like to think about this as like an ecology, right? So I've already formed my group and, you know, I've, I have volunteers and I have some projects. Next, I have to go out and I have to compete with other groups who have different ideas than I do. And I have to try to win funding and I have to try to win approvals to do my projects, right? So it's kind of like competing in an ecology to see who's going to come out on top. And I have choices to cooperate with other groups or to compete with them. Right. So inside of this ecology, what do we see? Well, in authoritarian regimes, we see that there's lower density and lower diversity. So what this means is we don't see as many groups in this system. So they're just overall fewer groups. We also see that groups tend to be clustered around certain policy areas instead of, you know, having groups that are addressing all different policy areas. And then really interestingly, because I see this a lot in, in China as well, is we see in authoritarian regimes, there isn't one ecosystem, there's actually two. So in a democracy, there's sort of one ecosystem. We're all competing for like Ford Foundation funding, right? What we see in authoritarian regimes is that the ecosystem sort of forms two bubbles that don't interact with each other. They're completely independent. And this is, these are the sort of regime loyalists or people who are close to the government. Sometimes they're even government organized groups, but these are the people who are the insiders. And then you have the more independent groups that are the outsiders. And they're in two completely different ecologies, different funding sources, different approval process, and they hardly ever interact. Right. They they both work on their projects in the same space, but as two separate entities. So that's a really interesting finding that we found in authoritarian regimes. However, we also see that a lot of times this competent this competition and cooperation dynamic is really similar to what we see with other advocacy groups in democracies. We see that they're competing with each other based on policy ideas, mostly. So they have different ideas for how to solve a similar problem and they're competing with each other because they each think their idea is the best, right? Um, and then we also see that they try to differentiate themselves from their competitors in a really strategic process. We see that in the United States as well as, as in China. And then in the advocacy strategy, so this is where you have groups, they've, they've gotten their funding, they're ready to launch their project. How do they launch their project? What sort of strategies do they use? Do they pick public protests? Do they pick public education? Do they want to hold a conference, right? How do they try to influence the government to change their policies in the way that the group wants? And what we see here is that in authoritarian regimes, your political resources matter a lot more. So what kind of access do you have? Do you have access to local government officials? This is a really big resource for these groups. And then we also see that in authoritarian regimes, there's this preference for seeking local policymakers versus national policymakers. So you don't see that a lot of groups like environmental groups in China, they're not going to Beijing and trying to knock on Xi Jinping's door, right? That's not what they're doing. Instead, what they do is they try to work at lower levels of government where they can access the policymaking process more easily. We see this in Russia, in Turkey, in Malaysia, in almost all the cases we looked at, we saw that they preferred local um, strategies. But similar to what we see in democracies, we see that most of the decisions about advocacy are actually driven by the group 
and their resources, right? So if they're a young group with a lot of tech savvy people, they'll probably pick a social media strategy because that's where their strengths are. So a lot of these choices are actually driven by the dynamics and the resources inside the group rather than the outside situation. Um, and then this is really interesting because I think this is something that most people wouldn't predict, but we see that both groups in democracies and authoritarian regimes prefer to use what we call outside lobbying tactics. This is basically trying to create public pressure, usually through the media, in order to change policymakers' minds. And I think a lot of times in democracies, you know, we think, of course, that's what you're going to do, right? If PETA wants people like to treat animals better, they're going to do some big campaign that captures public attention and changing people's ideas. But you imagine in China that, that this wouldn't happen, right? But I've told some of the students that I met with today about this really interesting case that um, I researched in Zhejiang province with a group called Green Zhejiang. So they, um, the local government had certified the water as top quality water, so clean that you could drink straight out of the rivers. And everyone knew that wasn't true. Everyone knew that the water was polluted, but that's what the government had said. And so this group created a campaign on social media called the Swimmable Rivers Campaign. And they asked people, they said that they would pay cash rewards to local government officials who had certified that water if they would drink the water or swim in the water to show how clean it was. You can imagine that none of them took them up on that offer, right? Because the water was polluted. And so what happened though, is this was funny and it was on social media and it became viral, right? And citizens were asked to submit their own pictures of the swimmable rivers that had been classified as the cleanest water out there, but had like visible trash and algae blooms and things like that. So it gathered so much attention that the party secretary for the province said, okay, we need to stop and we need to recertify all of the water. At that point, the group no longer kept pressing. Instead, they pivoted and they said, we want to help the government with their work. So we will meet with all of the local government officials and talk about this river chief model in Europe that's being used and is really successful and we'll help them implement it in China. And so in Zhejiang province and a couple other provinces have done this, we see that now there's a local government official who's in charge of the water certification. So it's a double certification process, right? So the Environmental Protection Bureau has to certify the water, but then a higher ranking government official has to sign off on it and it's their responsibility. If they test the water and find that it, it's not what they certified, that person is held responsible. And so it's been a very effective uh, system. And that was through a media strategy of like, um, you know, political satire. Mm -hmm. And then in this last um, outcome, I, I sort of led into this with this case study, right, that this is talking about influence outcomes. So in this part of the life cycle, these are groups, they formed, they've been competing for finances and ideas, they've come up with their advocacy strategies, and then we say, how successful are they? Are they able to change policy in the ways that they want? And so what we find is that in authoritarian regimes, that there are certain areas that are sensitive and groups can have no influence there, right? But in areas that aren't considered sensitive, we see that groups do have a lot of influence. For those of you who study, you know, the fascinating topic of, of trash or waste management in China, you know about the no burn coalitions and how they fundamentally shifted the policy that China had signed on to that they were going to incinerate trash, right? And now they're no longer considering that strategy. There's the plastic bag ban on thin uh, plastic bags. There are so many examples that we have of this. So in areas that aren't considered sensitive, we see a lot of policy success. Um, and then we also see that specific types of authoritarian regimes are more open to this influence than others. And these are regimes where their claims for legitimation, the way that they talk about themselves and why they should be the rightful government, are based on either economic performance or democratic procedure. So these are procedural regimes, right? So for regimes that talk about, um, you know, we won these elections, so this is why we get to be in power in Malaysia, they are much more open to civil society campaigns and lobbying campaigns, right? But also regimes that need highly technical information that is often hidden at the local level, they also are open to this influence because these lobbying groups carry this information to them. It's trusted information and it's information they couldn't otherwise gather.
So these types of regimes we see are very open to lobbying influence. Um, the other thing that we see is that um, when you have uh, when you have these, uh, I guess you could think about them as sort of schisms or disagreements over policy. So this is similar to what we see in democracies, and you could probably think of a million examples of this. But basically, if we see that there's elite disagreement, right? So there is a divide about what is the best policy, and elites aren't able to take action because they don't have consensus. Or in a situation where there's just uncertainty, like it's an emergent issue, like regulating AI, right? Something like that. No one knows what the right answer is there. That's particularly in, um, in both democracies and authoritarian regimes where we see people turn to expert groups, right, lobbying groups, because they're advocating a solution. And what they can do is find um, allies in this system and then try to push their policy um, opportunities through. So this is basically just a window of opportunity that we see both in democracies and authoritarian regimes. So this is what we find then. Um, and so when we look at these stages, what we see is that democracies and authoritarian regimes are different in the earlier stages. This seems to be where most political pressure is on these groups. So the pressure is on allowing them to form in the first place, to register, to get resources and start projects. Once they do all of that, once they get through that process, then we see that as far as strategies they're picking in the outcomes that they have, they're fairly similar to lobbying in democracies, very similar strategies, similar outcomes. So we don't find a lot of differences in these later stages. So this is why we think it's so important to take these theories from democracy and use them for authoritarian regimes is otherwise we wouldn't have found this finding, right? We would have been focused on what we see only in authoritarian regimes and thought that maybe it was an artifact of being an authoritarian regime when really it's an artifact of lobbying, right? Just the process of lobbying. And so this leads us then to this idea of, can we build a theory about uh, lobbying in authoritarian regimes? And the reason that we wanna do this again is this contribution to general theory, right? So when you study authoritarian regimes, it's only about elites and institutions. So if we wanna bring people back into that study, we have to have a way for people to, to think about their single country case study. How does it fit and how is it unique, right? And so what we tried to do then from all of the cases is we came up with three conditions that lobbyists in authoritarian regimes have to deal with that lobbyists in democracies don't. And this patterns or structures all of their um, activities. And so the first one then is access to policy making. So first of all, the size of the policymaking elite in authoritarian regimes is much, much smaller than in democracies, right? So we typically don't see that there are very decentralized models with powerful decision makers at the local level. And instead, these systems are much more hierarchical. We also see in democracies, you have different branches of the government that have control over different parts of the policy process. So you can lobby the executive branch, you can lobby the legislature. In authoritarian regimes, powerful elites are usually clustered in one body and not in others. So just the number of people that you need to reach in order to change policy is, is much, much fewer and it's harder to reach them. Right. So that's one thing then that is completely different that structures lobbying. Um, and then also the sources of elite policy competition. So in democracies, we see that people are competing to get elected. Right. And this is their their source of competition in authoritarian regimes. They might be competing over very, very different things. And so what groups have to figure out are where those divides are. And if you choose to ally with one side versus another, you have to know then that that moves you into being a political entity, right? You've now become part of the political structure. So it can be a successful strategy, but also a dangerous strategy. So that's one thing we see is how do they get access to policymaking? Right. And that's different. The other thing that we see is information demands are different in authoritarian regimes versus democracies. So do look, do leaders have availability of the information they need to make policy? Oftentimes they might not. Sometimes local level officials hide that information because they don't want to get in trouble. Sometimes there are communities that have been repressed by the government and so the government can't collect information easily. 
So oftentimes they don't have as much flow of information. There isn't like an independent media that's doing investigative reporting. And so policymakers can just read the paper to know what's going on. They don't have opinion polling to know what public opinion is, right? So there's a lack of information, which can make it so that there are more opportunities for these groups in authoritarian regimes than in democracies. There might be a need for them. Um, and then also, what is the need for policy relevant information? This is really important when you think about all the different regimes that we looked at. Does Kim Jong-un care what your public opinion is? Probably not, right? So in North Korea, they probably don't have a lot of need for policy relevant information. But for some of our other countries like Turkey, which is embedded you know, with the EU and the global economy or China, they do need policy relevant information. They have large complex economies and they need this information. So that opens Turkey and China up to lobbying in a way that you wouldn't see in North Korea. And then the last factor is social control. So unlike democracies, which of course can take coercive action, but in authoritarian regimes, coercive action can happen at any time and it can happen, it can change, right? So you can be, you can be advocating for something that's not sensitive and then it becomes sensitive, right? So overnight that can shift. And so we see the constant threat of repression, but we also see that there is sort of a repertoire of repression. And so there's harder repression, like we're going to jail you, and softer repression, like we're going to surveil you, right? Um, and then there are also policy red lines. So in democracies, we don't see that there are policy red lines in the same way that there are in authoritarian regimes. So like if you want to investigate the dictator's family's personal wealth, that's probably not a good idea, right? That's probably a red line. So this is what we see. And so those three conditions then, access to policymakers, access to information, and um, the possibility of, of coercion, those are going to pattern or create the playing field for lobbyists in non-democracies. And so, and so what is um, what we argue then happens is that it's not that we don't have lobbyists who are effective. We do, but they have to be really adaptive. So they have to understand these trade-offs and they also have to be willing to pivot. So that example of Green Jijang that I gave you, they knew when to use humor and attract attention and when to pivot to being an ally of the government. Let's help you find a solution, right? And so those are the sorts of, of um, of lobbyists who are effective. And we argue that they're thinking about making an exchange. So they're exchanging access to policymakers for information or other types of assistance. And they're thinking about making an exchange like that. Mm -hmm. So that's what we argue in the book. And again, I, I can't really do it justice in such a short time because there are these eight country case studies. The case studies about Turkey are really fascinating. Malaysia, Cambodia, there, there are really, really great cases in the book. And so you should definitely take a look at it and try to read some of these cases. You can order the book, but also they've made it open access. So if you go to the website, you can read chapters of the book for free with, without purchasing it. Maybe I shouldn't say that, right? I'm trying to like get people to buy my book, but you can read it for free. Um, so please, please do look at it. What we hope that people do is they take this model that we've developed and they use it for their research. So if you are doing a case study of a particular type of group in a non-democracy, that you take the hypotheses that we lay out for those three conditions, and then you use them to test your case. And it will show you what's the same, sort of what we see throughout other non-democracies and what's unique about your case. And so that's what we hope people will use the framework for. So I'll go ahead and stop there and, and turn everything over to Victor. Thank you. Um, I, there is still very much in the chart. I'll just <laughs> direct the Q&A, but I, I would like to take advantage and ask the first question. Which is to me, uh, some of this sounds like political opportunity structure, you know, which we we learn in grad school, sort of the access point and also the degree of repression. Mm -hmm. uh, but I think you raise a good point because you also mentioned the conditions under which even even if institutionally some of these regimes stay the same, you know, like a Leninist party like China. Uh, the political opportunity structure can change. Right. So besides uh, elite division, which you mentioned, mm -hmm. what are some of the other triggers for changes in the political opportunity structure in countries that 
you know, you've seen in your right. cases. Well, some of them are, are external or not fully under the control of the leaders, like some of the ones that, that you write about, like economic crises. So, you know, you can have an economic crisis that might trigger a, a change in elite understandings about what type of economy they want to have or monetary policy or something mm -hmm. like that. Um, in the cases that right. we look at, mm -hmm. some of them are as small as a lost election. So the case in Malaysia is, is the ruling party losing an election. And that sort of fundamentally started to shift their idea about the importance of, you know, voter mobilization, because voters weren't really supposed to be voting competitively, right? That wasn't the point that they did, because they were being mobilized by these youth organizations. Um, and so, you know, sometimes it's as simple as losing an election that you thought you would win. And in other times, it's much, much bigger things. But what we're trying to look at, I, I think the way that we differ from the political opportunity structure is that, you know, as you know, with that research, it's a little bit sort of post hoc, like once once the situation right. opens up, you're like, look at that political opportunity right. structure that opened. But how do people know it ahead of time? And that's what we're trying to get at is that the structure of the policymaking environment is driving these choices and that these these lobbyists are adapting to conditions as they change. So they're almost maybe maybe it's too much to say that they're creating their own windows of opportunity but they're definitely trying to create leverage constantly by making exchanges and so they're saying things like um you know you have a policy concern and we have an answer to that policy so let us help you and so that's not exactly what the political opportunity structure would identify as a window exactly but but they're sort of making it into one like that so i think that the groups that we're looking at have a lot more agency under this type of structure that they are constrained and those constraints are real right repression is real and it's a constant threat but they're also adapting to it and coming up with their own strategies and not just waiting for a window to open and then trying to take it does that does that answer your yeah, question? Yeah, yeah yeah no i mean i i like it. i mean this in a way we're talking about our respective edited book that was the spirit of our book also that there is right some agencies, you know, on, but for us, it was the regime, not the, the lobbyists or society. Right. Agency. So this is our bringing the people yeah, in, right? Like people. elites have agency, but so do people. Right. Exactly. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Right. Yeah. yeah. I'll let you um, so super interesting. I work on, you know, state founded civil society organizations in my own research. Yeah. And I was wondering, do you think of these as lobbying organizations in their purpose? And with some of them. And, and what, how, so you tell me more about yeah. that, why you think so, how that, yeah. So um, I was talking with a student earlier today who was saying, you know, how do you determine what these groups are? And, and I was saying, I don't. So, so basically I will, I'll talk to any group that is a group of citizens who had a concern and they formed themselves together to advocate for that. And I don't care if they're, you know, a, a indigenous culture group or a ladies dancing group or whatever they are, I'll, I'll talk to all of them. And so in, in my um, interviews, there are definitely a lot of or government organized groups that have become that over time. And then there are some that haven't. So like uh, some of the spinoff groups from the Women's Federation, especially in lesser developed provinces, they've become true advocacy organizations and they use their government given you know, budgets, access to the state owned media. They use those things as tools to get with the policies that they want. But then there are other groups. So some of the other gongos, like some of them in public health, they really are simply an extension of the, the Ministry of, of Health, and they're simply doing the projects that they're given. So that's what I look at, though, is, you know, do you have a policy focus and have you tried to come up with strategies to get your preferred policy? And how much do you think that's determined by, like, where the regime draws its red lines? Like, is that the primary determinative factor for that, you think? Because there's other things at play there. I think there are other things at play there. I mean, the red lines shift over time, too. So, like, in the early 2000s, as long as you weren't doing Tibet, you know, Taiwan, or Xinjiang, you could pretty much study almost anything you wanted. Even really sensitive issues in certain provinces, like HIV-AIDS, 
you could study them as long as the frame you used was the appropriate one, like a public health frame instead of a government policy created this crisis frame. Um, and so the, the red lines sort of shift over time. And so a lot of groups that I talk to, you know, they get a project approved and they even get local government funding to do the project. And then a week later, they get a frantic phone call. That's that we can't do that one any, you know, anymore. Let's save it. Let's, let's not work on it. And then sometimes they can be creative and change what they're doing. Um, so like one good example is if I stick with my green Zhejiang um, um, case study. So I was just doing an interview with that same organization just this summer when I was able to go back to China. And they're, they've expanded like by three times as large as they used to be. And I said, you know, where's all your funding coming from? Because the other sources of funding they were getting for, were from international environmental groups, right? And that's no longer a source of, of funding. And they said that they're doing almost all government contracts. Contracting. And like a lot of other Western scholars, I was like, oh, so you're basically just an extension of the government now. They give you the project. They tell you what to do. And what he was saying is actually he has a lot more ability to shape policy now than he's ever had be because he's on the inside of the process. So Beijing passes these really complex environmental regulations. They send them down to these poor county governments who don't even know how to read the regulations, let alone how do you put them into your process. So if you're going to build a road, what, how do you build in a process for like an environmental assessment, right? It's not in those regulations now, you need to add them in, but they don't know how to do that. And so they've been contracting with his group to go line by line through all their regulations and add in where the environment needs to go but they don't know how to read the regulations. And so he's added in all sorts of public comment periods and like citizen town halls for affected communities, a notification period before the project starts. None of this is in the actual regulation, but he thinks it's important if you're going to have an environmental policy. So he's added all of these things in and now the government just does it because that's what's written down in their procedure. So, you know, in a lot of ways, this being close to the regime can be a source of power. I, what I usually ask is more about who sets the ideas, where do the policy ideas come from, and you know how how does that process work with the government? So how much control do they have over the policy versus you? And so that's the key question for me that I try to look at. Yeah. Just as a two finger on that, because I was thinking about the same thing, because what I have observed in the case of China is that there were a lot of so-called mm -hmm. you know, they sometimes can be lower level cadres right. who have certain ideas, mm -hmm. who just wanted to sort of bring this to the attention of the higher authorities. Right. So a lot of these things going on sort of that way in the system, yeah. whereas the government would cast very suspicious eye, no matter how good the idea is, the policy idea is, on anyone chief you might associate mm -hmm. with America or associated with right. some kind of a you know uh groups. So so that brings up the question of your basic frame, the philosophical framing of the state and society. Mm -hmm. So so in a way what you're describing is much more akin to what um uh what's his name we, we coined this term called state in society kind of perspective. Mm -hmm. right? we probably know right. uh, who we are talking about it, the this to be the UW uh Seattle for for uh, um, uh, but you're not you're not talking about the social corporatism framework. No, no. no. Um, but anyway, I'll okay. Come, maybe come to, <laughs> okay. So, so in other words, the boundary between the state and society, the way that you're presenting them, seems to be a bit more rigid than what actually is happening. That that I've known, you know, fairly yeah. high level officials. It's in the finance area, for example. They form a group called, right. you know, Jin Long Wu Shi for example, mm -hmm. right? Finance fifty, right. but these are pretty much the elites in the, in the, in the absolutely, right? and yeah. they are very much in the government. Absolutely, but they team up and they push some ideas from the outside. Yeah, right? uh, from from seemingly from outside. Mm -hmm. So, so that's that's the question about state society about it. And is your are you using the same like way with what you mean by lobbyists as policy entrepreneurs? You know, we we often in the literature we talk about policy entrepreneurs. Yeah. That's basically the, the framework that we're using. Okay. So 
anybody who is well, trying to that policy entrepreneurs you're using the right budget exactly okay. and so in the book of course you know we have pages of like definitions about which groups sure. fit this definition and what lobbying means in this context but that's basically what we're saying is that people who want to change policy yeah. and you know i actually agree with you though i don't think that there is a strong boundary between state and society i think that it's blurred and it's blurred on purpose because of the rules so the the changes in in 2016 to the charity law and the of, um, overseas NGO law, it, it divided out the NGO community into domestic versus international and sort of walled them off from each other in order to blur those lines between domestic groups and the government. And in lots of areas, they were already fairly blurry, like the Gongos. And then I also interviewed lots of government officials who, you know, they're forced to retire at a fairly young age, but they're young, they're healthy, they want to contribute, they think they have good ideas. And so a lot of times they would form these like civil society groups and, and try to lobby the government. Of course, you know, it's calling the person that took their job and saying, hey, I have a good idea. Um, but we count all of those types of groups as well because they're trying to change policy. And so then we would just break them up by their tactics and see what tactics they're using. Those are the regime insider tactics, right? Instead of the outsider tactics. So I think that that's actually very, very blurred. And I think that that's sort of a hallmark of governance under Xi Jinping. He's blurring the line between SOEs and private companies. He's blurring the line between state and society, where the state ends and civil society begins under a contracting model. I think that's all very purposeful. Um, and you know what? I guess what I'm looking at is how do groups under those conditions still decide what policies they want and how do they push for them? And then I, what I want to study is their tactical choice. Like which tactics do they pick and how successful are those tactics? So I guess I'm not, I don't, I don't have a lot of judgment about the group origins or whether they use insider strategies or external strategies. I really just want to know like what strategy are you using and how effective is it? What are the, what do you, what is the exchange that you have to give up? And that's what I was really curious from, from Green Jijang. They're housed now actually in a government building, in the local community building. And so saying to him, like, is this a good choice or a bad choice, right? And so, but he was talking about the trade-offs. So there, there are good things about that choice and then there are some consequences. But he's well aware of those things and, and is thinking, you know, about them. Joel, Joel Mikdahl, that's the person. Oh, oh, yes. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> yes. Yeah. I may have a um, question. So you mentioned a lot of time about off the right lines. And I have a question about how you to identify this kind of question, the coll uh, collusion behaviors between the government and the business. And it's a common sense, for example, in, especially in the medical, maybe the health policy, health insurance uh, sector, the medicine, the pharmacy companies want to fund uh, some, some university professors and try to provide a really, really good, maybe a paper, maybe a conclusion that they can make their medicines into the list of medicines. Right. And that will get some much money and uh, from the health insurance. So this is kind of the conclusion behaviors. Is that kind of the, all, beyond the right line or below the right line, so illegal or legal scale? Well, Xi Jinping's new anti-corruption campaign is in the medical sector, so he says it's illegal. <laughs> so it's not just a red line; it's it's illegal behavior. It's it's part of corruption. So um, the the red lines that we're talking about are sort of policy areas where you can't necessarily advocate for something different from what the government is saying. So that that's really clear in the case of Taiwan, right? So if I'm a civil society group and I want to talk about you know pathways for uh, independence for Taiwan, that's a, a red line, right? I, I won't be able to form a group and I won't be able to advocate for that. So that's an easy one. The trickier ones are ones that shift over time. So sometimes there are things that because they're phrased a certain way, they are talked about. And then once they get phrased a different way, you can no longer talk about them. So those are the trickier red lines that we were talking about the, the adaptive lobbyists have to understand. And so you'll see that sometimes the agenda 
stays fairly constant, but the ways that people talk about things, they shift, right? So they shift from like harmonious society to common prosperity, and there's sort of new framing put on things to keep it out of a sensitive area. But you have to be really careful with this because again, these red lines shift all the time. So in, in a recent survey that I did in China, you know, when I wrote the survey, it was okay to use Xi Jinping's name in the questionnaire, but by the time we were ready to launch it, we were no longer allowed to use his name. So it's kind of like Voldemort, right? He who shall not be named. <laughs> so you had to say like the current leader, uh, the leadership um, in the last 10 years, right? So you had to sort of use these phrases without using his name. So that's what I mean about adapting to those red lines. So you could choose not to do the survey or you could choose to use some creative terminology. Um, yeah, uh, do you want to take well, questions? No, go ahead. Okay. 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 Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Hi, uh, I just wanted to ask if, as a follow to a previous question, how different is the process of forming a civil society group at different levels of society? Because you talked about how people who are in these groups are mm -hmm. oftentimes already in the system, like maybe they had the job previously, right. like especially in a place like an autocracy where there's a higher degree of like just political repression or general like apathy, like mm -hmm. how, like what does the process look like for an average citizen who may want to like lobby a specific policy or become part of the group? Like, yeah. How does that work? Well, so since 2016, the process is that um, you have to register with the whatever the local level of the Ministry of Civil Affairs is. So like, let's say you're at the city level, that would be the Bureau of Civil Affairs that you would go and you would register with. And you have to fill out this paperwork that sort of gives the, the group name. You need a separate bank account with a certain amount of investment. Um, you need to have like an address. You need to have a list of board members. So there's certain information that you need in order to register. And then once you're given that status, then every year it's you it's renewed. So you have to go through the process again. There are easier ways of registering. So you can also register as a social enterprise. And this is done through commerce and not civil affairs. So as a social enterprise, you're treated as a business with a social mission, basically. Um, and so for a lot of organizations that would prefer to have less regulation and just pay taxes instead, they choose to register that way. So there are two different options really for registration, but you have to register now. It used to be that um, for a while, a lot of groups would work locally and they were just kind of informal groups and they weren't really registered, but that became very problematic. Um, you know, they would have all of the group money in their own private banking accounts. And so, you know, there, there wasn't any legal differentiation between the founder and the organization. And so since those rules have changed, now there's a clear differentiation between somebody who founded the organization and the organization itself. It has its own legal status. So that's been the big shift. Um, now, if you're a foreign NGO, that's completely different and pretty complex. Then you have to register with the Public Security Bureau at the level in which you're registering. And then you also have to have a supervisory agency, which is a government agency. So for example, if I'm Oxfam, that would probably be like the Poverty Alleviation Bureau. Um, so once you do that, then you have to register all of your activities. So um, if you want to partner with a group, you have to register that project and get approval. If you want to run a project, you have to register that activity and get approval. So they have a lot more regulations now for international groups. Okay. Like how liberally would you say is that kind of like civil group, like state is giving out to like, well, international is like much harder, but like for local groups? Yeah. Like, how do you feel about like, how the government is like kind of integrating them into like their system now. So there seems to be more of like a civil society, like almost democratic kind of trend going on or? Not really. <laughs> I, wouldn't, I wouldn't call it a democratic trend exactly, but I would call it like an intermediary uh, section of society that's forming, especially with a lot of government contracts around social work. So those sorts of social work organizations that are taking over government work, they're really active in all sorts of, of areas. And they are sort of, they're, they're mediating between society and the state. And so for that type of organization, that is something different that we haven't seen, that sort of intermediation. Um, 
the the number of groups that are forming, you know, the regulations, it allowed some groups to grow really much bigger than they had ever been before and more powerful. Um, but all small groups weren't able to make that cutoff. They weren't able to register, which means they can't run projects and they can't get funding. So it really sort of it forced the death of a lot of small groups. Um, but for the groups that made that cut, most of them are doing better than they were before. Um, for the international groups, um, I think it's the China file that has a project on that. So you can look at their data, but they show that almost all of the groups, the international groups that were active in China before are still active, but there's been a division. So some of them temporarily register activities. So every year they just register an activity, but they don't register themselves. But then a lot of the biggest groups who've been really active in China, they have registered themselves. Mm -hmm. So they don't find a loss in the number of groups. They find that mm -hmm. like some small projects that were sort of, you know, by groups that would just come in every once in a while, that those have gone away. But most people are still there. They just are choosing different registration strategies. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah. Under autocracy, what are the consequences of inadvertently crossing the red line. Yeah, so there's mm -hmm. a there's a repertoire. So a lot of times there aren't really harsh consequences if you've crossed a red line for the first time or if it was something that was okay and is now not okay. So if you're sort of unknowingly doing it, usually what happens is they come and they take you for tea. <laughs> so they invite you to go have tea and they tell you what you've done that's wrong. Um, so usually that's the first step. After that, there is no poison. The what? No, yeah, yeah, no poison underwear. That's just Russia. So, <laughs> so in China, at least, you know, there, there's sort of a step up in tactics um, all the way to the group being closed. And then usually not the people who work for the group, but the group leaders can then face penalties. A lot of times it's tax fraud penalties. Um, sometimes it's going to jail for other reasons, like disturbing the public peace or something like that. All the time I thought after it would be lying. <laughs> Uh, one more quickly. Very, very okay. quick. <laughs> May, do you have a question? Yeah, I just wanted to say I thought it was really great. Um, and a lot of, I think, you know, relevant, having a very broad note right across regime types. Um, one thing that came up in our research, which I'm wondering, you know, it's like the interplay between different strategies. Yeah. So like, yeah, where, for example, you might have like one type of group um, employing more like outsider oppositional tactics to like create yeah. a crisis and then more solution than inside the group. Did you see that type of interaction? Not as much. So in the groups that we look at, in the, the case study on Turkey is a really great example of how the, the women's groups are so bifurcated. Mm -hmm. They operate in completely different spaces. They don't compete or cooperate with each other in most cases. And that's mostly what I see in groups in China, too, is that like the gongos sort of have their own strategies and their own projects and the grassroots groups do their own things, too. Now, inside of each one of those ecosystems, there is cooperation and they do work together. Um, but I haven't seen a lot of strategies where uh, an insider group and an outsider group are collaborating to get the same thing. They just seem to function in two completely separate worlds. Yeah. Great. Uh, we're out of time. I think we'll hang out outside after this. We're yeah. to vacate this room. Uh, don't forget on November 16th, our next talk will be Oriana Skyla Mastro. And she's going to talk about Upstart, how China became a great power. Uh, so that's <laughs> going to be really interesting. But please join me in uh, thanking Dr. Dave.